Able Then On Air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together. Media sponsors for Able Then On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yehad, New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity. Able Den on Air has been seen in the following publications, Parkchester Times, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, and www.h.com. Ableton On Air is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Sider. I'm on. And on this um, program today, we talk about Team 2. But before that, we'd like to say um, special thanks to our uh, sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many others, including the partnership with the Association for the Blind um, and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Division for the Blind of Visually Impaired of Vermont, Central Vermont, Habitat for Humanity, and many, many, many others. Um, with us, uh, we have Kristen yep. Chandler. Kristen Chandler from Team Two. Um, we're supposed to have another guest, but that person has not shown yet. Um, however, um, we would like to say thank you for joining us on this edition. Happy to be here Able again. You bet. Um, what is the missions and goals of Team Two? Well, Team Two is a statewide uh, training for first responders, really, in a nutshell. The, the missions and goals are really to build the relationships necessary for um, first responders to be able to collaborate in responding to a mental health crisis call. Mm -hmm. So we offer the training in five regions around the state um, with that I, the purpose of building those relationships with fellow first responders who you might be responding to a call with in that region. So for police, uh, dispatchers, mental health crisis workers, EMTs, uh, emergency department personnel are invited because of that handoff in a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, I also invite uh, state's attorneys to attend. Um, and that's about who gets, you know, notice of the trainings and the, and the dates and things. Mm -hmm. So the, the goal is um, really just to hear about what's working in that region for them, what isn't working, to give some people some ideas about how to better collaborate and come to a, a really peaceful resolution in a mental health crisis. Uh, please tell our viewers and listeners um, about the program and really how it works. And sure. Yeah. So uh, Team 2 was the idea of Mary Moulton um, just about 10 years ago when Mary came to the state and she came to the Department of Mental Health. Uh, she came from Washington County Mental Health where uh, she had been a crisis screener and for many, many years. And when she came to the state level, she realized that not every part of the state enjoyed the same great collaborative relationship that they have in Washington County between crisis workers and law enforcement for many, many years. And so she had this idea about, let's see if we can't improve that around the state. And so she brought together a bunch of um, stakeholders from various police agencies, uh, state agencies, consumers, advocates, um, 
lots of people from different mental health agencies, and we met for mm, probably over a year uh, trying to come up with some, a curriculum that would be a, fit into one day because we realized, Mary realized, we, we actually, in, in discussion, we realized that it'd be a lot easier to get people to a one-day training as opposed to two-day or even a week-long training, which is um, what's done in a lot of other parts of the country. So the, the, that, that started 10 years ago. I was at the Department of Mental Health then as an assistant attorney general working with Mary. And once we got the basic ideas down about what we wanted in the curriculum, she kind of handed it over to me and asked me to you know, make this happen. So in 2013, we started our first train the trainer program around the state again. So people are trained by their peers. There's 30 five instructors in the five regions around the state. Um, and I've brought one of them here with me today from the central region, uh, from the Montpelier PD. Um, and, and I will pause right there so I can have Victor uh, introduce himself. Um, we'll be right back in a couple of minutes to talk more about Team 2. We'll be back after these words. Welcome back to A Boulder On Air. And joining us is, um, what is your name, please? Victor Anahosa, I work for the Montpelier Police Department. Okay. Um, so, um, we, we're talking about Team 2 and um, the, the, you know, how it started and all that. Um, have, uh, have you pre uh, pre perceived any notions regarding Team 2 prior to training? Like, what type of training have you received? And any expectations um, thus far, and how is how is Team Two working as a program? So, before I took Team Two, the only the closest training I had in mental health was the Act 80, which was acquired by the Academy, um, which Christian actually also uh, was my trainer there. Um, so when I took Team Two, I thought it was going to be similar to that, and I wasn't expecting the amount of collaboration that that we had having people from fire, EMS, mental health um, professionals, people from state's attorney's office, and also um, dispatchers. I thought it was very interesting having all these stakeholders that respond to crises all in the same training. Mm -hmm. Define, um, either, either of you can take this one. Define mental health crisis and how. So it, it's paired with a social worker and a police officer, or how does it work within? Well, let's back up just a second, because I think you asked just a couple different questions I'm right sorry. there. But yeah, right. so uh, I would first of all, the mental what what is a mental health crisis? Um, yes, and how is it? We're, we're kind of getting away from that term a little bit, Lawrence. We're more calling it like an emotional crisis or a behavioral issue, because it can really run the gamut. Right. I mean, people just are, are in crisis, especially now during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, people are finding themselves, you know, stressed to the max on all different kinds of issues. And so yeah. it has been the fallback for, you know, forever, really. If you're in a crisis, who do you call? You dial 911. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the police are always going to be there and they're going to respond. Mm -hmm. And we're really trying to kind of back up from that right now. Mm -hmm. And um, allow for some alternative types of response. And so to that end, uh, Montpelier Police have um, collaborated, <clears throat> excuse me, with Washington County Mental Health and with Barry City Police to hire uh, a s embedded, what we call an embedded social worker. So somebody who is employed. What does it mean in embedded yeah, social worker? Yeah, I'm explaining that. She's a, employed by Washington County Mental Health as a licensed clinician, mm -hmm. but she sits with the police departments. She has an actual desk, both in Barrie and in Montpelier, and she can ride along with the officers. So she splits her time between the two cities, and uh, she can ride along with the officers. She can go out on her own on calls. If, if safety is not a concern, she can respond on her own. Because of that, that real variety in what what is a crisis, you know, maybe that somebody they just need a place to stay, or they might need some food, mm -hmm. and that that would put them in a crisis. That's something that Susan could handle, the embedded worker, mm -hmm. versus, you know, they're in an acute psychotic episode, mm -hmm. and, you know, they're they're causing some property destruction or something. And you need police intervention, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But you also Susan can also be there to then offer resources and follow up. 
And I know, I think Victor has been able to benefit from having her in the department. Absolutely. So you may want to say something about mm -hmm. that. What, what um, so let's piggyback off, but even before the pandemic, I mean, um, I'm gonna kind of add a little bit, couple of questions here. Even before the pandemic, in, since we're getting away from crisis, but people that have emotional situations, how, even before Team 2, right, how has the police department been dealing with that and then now with Team 2, has it gotten better? Has it gotten, uh, I wouldn't say worse, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind, uh, uh, kind of uh, walk us through the situation. So, I don't know what we did before, um, but I know that. Well, I'm you but with Team Two, um, it's it for from an officer standpoint, it helps open our eyes and see all the different resources that are available, and it puts us all together in one room so we can actually have conversations um, with the same people that we're going to be calling upon, and it gives us a little bit of um, insight into their job and their role. And in turn, that helps us because then we all have a better understanding of when we're responding to to a call, how we can all help each other out. Mm -hmm. um, now, yeah, what what outcomes or impact of Team Two trainings? Um, wait, uh, to be quanti quantified or or like put together, like what? What, what have been the outcomes of the Team 2 training? Well, I think one of the things I can, I can, I'll just ask Victor to respond to this, because I remember when he was in training, um, you know, part of the curriculum for that one day includes um, a little segment on responding to people on the autism spectrum, because that's a pretty frequent call. And it was within a few weeks, I think, of the training where Victor had a call like that, he responded to that, and uh, I'll, I'll let him take it from there. We had a, a 911 hang up call. Um, there was no other information besides 911 hang up. It mapped uh, the address for it, so I went out to the address, made contact with uh, a, a mother, and she told me that uh, they, the parents had not called 911. They weren't really sure where it came from, but they told me that uh, they had uh, a son that had autism and they thought that he might have done it and so she went into his room found her cell phone there and and found that he had dialed 911 this is right after you i took you actually get in trouble for accidentally dialing 911 <laughs> well they weren't in, in this case or? no 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 they weren't in trouble but if someone does dial 911 we have to go out and just make sure that everyone's okay, okay yeah, yeah. Mm. so i was able to to make contact um with their son check their welfare they were all okay and Obviously, he just made, uh, made a mistake that, that everyone made. I think when I was a kid, I made that same mistake. Um, and I think it's something that, yeah, as a kid, you just have to get out of the way once. And then you know, once you see the police show up, that's probably the last time that it happens. But I took that time to connect with uh, the child that was in the residence and their family. Um, and I, I talked to them about the Team 2 training that I just had. And I talked to them about how uh, it would be important for the department to know that they have, um, they have their, their son that's, that's living uh, with autism with them. And he had, um, the mother told me that several times in the past, and she expected in the future that he would elope um, from the residence and possibly run into traffic, try to run to school, which is very dangerous. Um, so it gave me the opportunity to turn that, you know, pretty simple call, 911 hang up, uh, into an opportunity to let the other officers on the road know that um, we have this community member that you know we should um, take extra time and care with. Um, and I was able to let the, the rest of the department know that should they respond um, in the future, um, they, and I don't know if I, I probably shouldn't say the, 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 the child's name, but um, when they're responding to, to him, the mother told me uh, things that he liked, things that he didn't like, that he was nonverbal, um, that he was attracted to water even though he... So there's certain nonverbal cues with autism that you were being trained on within... Right, with Team 2. Mm -hmm. uh, and recognized those when I was on scene at this 911 hang-up call. Um, and the mother was very um, surprised at the amount of knowledge that I had, and I told her that it was for my Team 2 training, and she said she wished that every police officer had that same training so that they'd have that same understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so did you want to ask, uh, uh, go ahead with some of your questions? Yeah, um, 
Staying away from that other one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. What improvements have been made since, you know? What, what improvements? improvements have been made since uh, Team 2 has been in, um, in, 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 in use? What improvements in, in, in police response? In, yeah. In helping people yeah. with mental health issues? Sure. That's yeah. a great question, Arlene. Thank you. Um, I, well, as Victor just touched on, it, the, the training itself just opens people's eyes to a gamut of possibilities. And uh, it not, not just, you know, responding to people on the autism spectrum, but it's a scenario-based training. And every year, we have three scenarios in the day. And every year, we change them a little bit, depending on what, what's going on. Um, there may be a current issue, uh, you know, statewide that uh, a lot, I've heard a lot about, so we'll add that in. Um, so it has, um, it's, I, was, I will say it has improved the relationships between mental health crisis teams and their local law enforcement and the state police. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, do other states have something similar to Team 2? They do not. We've yeah. actually presented Team 2 at a few national conferences um, where uh, I've had the opportunity to go um, and present and I've learned that other states actually don't do this. And this is really geared to, because we are a small rural state, it makes sense to do this kind of training in a one day, an eight hour training that, because we have so many small police departments, it makes it a lot easier for them to be able to attend, first of all, as opposed to a, what's the national uh, training really is a 40 hour training. And it's really hard for local departments to send uh, all their officers to a whole week of training. Mm -hmm. Because who would mind the shop? So the improvements have been, um, you know, they're anecdotal. But I will tell you that um, we, means... meaning that I hear about various um, calls around the state where people have responded, and they've gotten a, a much better resolution that they attribute to the training, just as Victor just talked about. I mean, he attributed that his ability to make that, you know, respond that way on that call directly to the training um, that he took. And so that's what I, you know, we don't keep, this. it's hard to keep statistics on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we do do a follow-up evaluation of, uh, we send a survey to everybody six months after they've taken the training, anybody who's attended to see if they're using the tools that they learned in the training. And um, I'm gonna say, I think it's about 92% of the people say that they continue to use those tools um, they continue to have really good relationships, uh, improved relationships with their fellow first responders, and they have a much better understanding of how each other does, does their job, really. They learn each other's li limitations and their language um, yeah. during the training, and they've been able to retain that, which is great. Mm -hmm. oh, how long is the training for? Yeah, like how It's eight hours. Eight hours. Yeah. Over three one. days? No. It's eight hours. For and one it's one day. It's one day, yep, and it's offered in uh, a six, at least six times a year in five regions around the state. So uh, the Northwest region, which is Chittenden and Franklin counties, they get the training twice a year. Everybody else gets it once a year. But I have added, I mean, there's always some additional trainings, um, like some police departments might ask for some extra training, and we'll, we'll figure out a way to do that for them. Mm -hmm. um. What is the value of recognizing the importance of mental health and policing? Either, both of you can answer this question. I think that um, every day we get a call for service that in some way, shape, or form involves someone either having a, a mental health crisis or having a crisis in general. And having the Team 2 training under your belt helps you better respond to those instances because it gives you a better understanding of the services that are available and it gives you a better understanding of, of how those services is going to help that person. I think, Lawrence, if I can just add to that, I think it's important to note that Team 2 is funded by a, a, a collaboration between the Department Washington of Public County. Safety and Department of Mental Health. Oh. Um, they collaborate in, in a grant but it's year to year mm -hmm. so it's not, and this is not a training that's mandatory for police officers it's voluntary no um, since you said that yep okay should it be in all should team two or a version of team two be in every single police department globally because <laughs> this this is new this might be new 
but you know, due to the fact of um, the situation with um, the way people perceive policing in various incidents all across the globe, not mentioning any particular incidents, but and should um, you know, should Team Two B or a version B um, in every single police department? Do you think? I think that here in Vermont, Team Two should definitely be mandatory for for any law enforcement officer, mental health um, professional, anybody that, that works at a state attorney's office, firefighters, EMTs, they're all gonna benefit from that. Globally, I think anybody in, in public service or really anybody at all would benefit from having some sort of mental health training. Your take on that? Well, I think we've, we've discussed this a lot over the years um, since Team Two started. Um, Especially, I would say, in the last three years or so, the legislature has actually asked me that very question. Like, why, if this is such a great training, why isn't it, why don't we make it mandatory? Like some of the other trainings are for police. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my response is, I think it's, it's a, it's a, you have a different approach when you come to a training because you want to be there, or you're there voluntarily. Maybe your supervisor has asked you to come, but as opposed to if it's mandatory. Because law enforcement has a lot of other required trainings they have to do every year. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's, you, I think you get a whole different attitude and perspective when you're there because you, you're interested in the topic and you want to be there. Mm -hmm. That being said, I do think that a lot of other states have a required um, follow-up training every year in mental health for police, and we do not, Vermont does not. The mm -hmm. only requirement Vermont has is that initial eight-hour training that Victor alluded to that um, I teach at the police academy along with a clinician and a law enforcement officer. That's required by statute in Vermont, but other than that, there is no other requirement, and I would love to see um, a requirement for a refresher in mental health, specifically geared for mental health response, whether it's four hours or eight hours or if it's every year or every two years, but something, because things change. The law changes, um, um, you know, certain uh, political events can change how a community, a pandemic, you know, can really affect how a community responds to crisis. And so I think it would be beneficial to have a follow-up training. Mm -hmm. um. Now, uh, can you describe a scenario um, without, uh, you know, without violating HIPAA, obviously, um, but can you describe a scenario uh, where training was put into use? Um, I think that uh, the 911 hang-up one was a great one. Um, the, I think that uh, to add off of what I already said about that, after that call, because that was probably, that was late at night. Um, well, a, a couple after, after 12 midnight, after 12 midnight? Or? Uh, it, it was probably around midnight that that call came in. Mm. Wow. A, couple, a couple days after that though, uh, the mother asked me to, uh, to go back to the house because um, her son had a gift for me. And I went uh, and he had uh, wrote a, thank you officer on a piece of paper and drawn on it and decorated it for me um, as a little token. Uh, and I thought that was, that was pretty special. And I think that, um, you know, w we respond to mental health calls, uh, like I said, every single day. I think that the impact that we make can, can be positive or negative. And if we can make those positive connections, um, it's great because, you know, then we can build relationships with, throughout the community that are gonna be everlasting. I think that that was a very good experience um, for me, certainly, and, and, and for that family. Mm -hmm. um, what is the, well, we have, we have some, uh, obviously we have a little, a little bit more time left. Um, perhaps an obvious question would be, um, but what is the ideal outcome in a scenario following a mental health question? The ideal outcome? Yeah, like, well. what have, what have, outcomes have been, or, I mean, obviously, can you tell what an outcome would be if you're there, or not? Um, I think I, I think I 
I think I'm gonna. I think I understand your question. But the so the ideal outcome in any mental health crisis would be that everybody that it gets resolved safely with nobody getting hurt, mm -hmm. and that the proper resources are provided to the individual uh, to hopefully prevent another a crisis happening again in the future. I don't know if that, that's how, that's my take on it. I don't know. I'd like to know what Victor's take on I, it is. I, I, sure. I think I think that's absolutely right. I mean. We want everyone to be safe. We want them, you know, I'd like everyone to be happy um, with the outcome that they have. And if that means, you know, that we show up on scene and provide a courtesy ride to someone um, to, go, to go somewhere that they need to get resources, I think that, you know, we would very much so do that for them. Um, the best outcome for us um, is making sure that that person gets the type of help and services that they need. I'll say, Lauren, I think, Lawrence, to just for your, for your viewers that one of the things that we really focus on in any mental health training with police is to slow things down and to take the time. What, <coughs> excuse me. What do you me. mean by slow? What I do you mean, mean to by not slow things down? to uh, really evaluate the situation, to think about not just rush in, and to think about get as much information as possible um, on the way to the call, and then during the call, and to partner with the correct. Um, experts in the field, and, and if it's a mental health call, it would be hopefully partnering with Washington County Mental Health crisis screeners who would be able to come to the scene or at least provide assistance over the phone and just slow things down and take your time. And this has been, this is not new really, but it's, I would say in the last couple of years, more and more um, uh, police chiefs and administrators have <clears throat> realized that this is really what's going to keep their officers safe as well as the subject safe, mm -hmm. is if you can take that time to establish those relationships, just as Victor did in that 911 hang-up call. He, took, he didn't have to go back and meet this kid and hang out with him in his room and play with him, but he did. And that just goes a really long way. And I know, um, you know, I've heard from lots of other officers and other uh, consumers where they're like, wow, if, if we just take the time to really talk to somebody and figure out what it is that's at the core of the problem, we might be able to resolve it now as opposed to having to go, you know, hands on and, and you know, into and a big the scuffle. Thing. Becomes worse if you don't. Right, right. And that's really what we, and, and we really want for the situation to not become worse, right? We want it to be, um, to not, we don't want the pol presence of the police to escalate the stress or the, the concern. And, and, and we know that for some people that can be uh, difficult, right? Seeing the police come to, a, to their home or to a scene um, can sort of increase that anxiety or increase that, um, that stress. And so that's the other thing we talk a lot about is just how an officer is gonna approach a particular call, whether they're going to come lights and siren or they're going to just come park maybe farther away and walk up, you know, really focusing on what's still going to keep them safe, but what might actually uh, benefit the subject of the call. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. Any female, female officers taking this training? Oh, yeah, all kinds of female officers taking the training. Yeah. Okay. Does the training differ between, um, uh, if you don't mind me asking this, does, it, does the training differ between male and female? Like, is there a certain other training that the female takes that the male doesn't take, or is it all one training? It's all one training. You know what? Yeah, okay. no, there's nothing like, different like for. Certain, um, I know that, like, I know the regular police training involves, like, um, obstacle courses and other things, but then. Sure. Yeah. I just want There's to a lot of uh, exercise involved in the police academy, and the the women do it as well as the men. Okay. Uh, no, I, I I hope that wasn't a bad question. No, and I can tell you. So I I do some training at the police academy for the Vermont State Police, and um, a couple uh, sessions ago, for the first time, they had more women in the in their class than they did men, mm -hmm. actually. Um, this I just did one a couple weeks ago for them for this current class, mm -hmm. and it was all men. It was 13 men. Um, so it was just a little bit unusual that they didn't have any female applicants or um, of recruits. Mm -hmm. Normally, they have quite a few. I know they've made a big effort to try to uh, recruit more uh, women and minorities. Okay. Um, 
Uh, please, okay. Uh, what is the value? Oh wait, I already. Um, anything you anything you want to say more about Team Two and the future of uh, Team Two? I just think uh, I thought of a, another great example um, of that training being used in the field. I responded to a call um, that there was a female that was in the bathroom. Um, she had fallen, and, and the people I called said that they didn't really know what was going on, mm -hmm. and they weren't sure if it was a medical call. They weren't sure if they needed the fire department, police department. They were, it was very vague. Or she got stuck in the, the The call came in very vague. Um, and when calls like that come in, typically they dispatch the police just because they want someone, they want a first responder on scene to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I walked in. And the people that had called, this is at a hotel. They called and they said, "We don't know. We don't understand what she's saying. We don't know what she what she wants. But she it seems like she's she doesn't want anybody to help them. She keeps moving her hands around, um, and it seems like she doesn't want people to be around her. So we just left her alone. And we called you. I go into the bathroom, um, and uh, it was it was a female that was um, sitting on the ground, and I could tell she was crying. Introduced myself. Hi, I'm Officer Victor. Uh, you know." What, what can I do to help you? And uh, she turned to me. She made some movements with her hands that at first I didn't really recognize what were, and then I quickly realized that um, she was deaf. And the way that she communicated, um, uh, she couldn't talk, um, but she could write. And so I, just like Christian said, what, what, we're, what all law enforcement officers are trying to do now, slow things down, slowed everything down, recognized what was in front of me, took out a pad and um, a pad of paper and, and my pen um, and just wrote. And that's how we communicated um, back and forth and realized that she had been recently discharged from the hospital. She didn't have a ride home. Um, she knew that uh, she knew the name of, of her social worker. So I called them. They came right over from uh, the hospital um, and and helped me get a better understanding of, of this person. Um, and I was able to provide her uh, a ride home, and that's really all she needed. So it, that call came in very vague, got on scene, recognized what, what happened, slowed things down, called in additional resources, um, and then it, we know we had a really great outcome are, are of- Are police officers in the Montpelier Police Department, do they have training in sign language or anything with deaf individuals? Uh, in this case? I know I don't. Um, so I, I had to use the, the resources that I had available, and I was fortunate that um, uh, that writing on writing on the on the piece of paper that was the uh, the best way to communicate with her, and that's what her, her social worker said that that's how that's how she communicates with people. Mm -hmm. um, what is the future of Team Two? Well, hopefully it continues on. <laughs> um, as I said, it is a it's a usually it's a year to year grant from the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Public Safety. Um, that's just part of their budgets. So um, we, we've really seen the benefit of the training um, just over and over again, saving resources. So I think it's a, it's a good investment. So I certainly hope it will continue. Um, I think we, we, we might expand the audience a little bit. I've had some requests from like college security officers who aren't police officers, but and who don't get a lot of mental health training, but do respond to a lot of mental health crises. So we have that request. We've got, uh, I've had some requests from the Department of Corrections. So there's a, there's a, there's a way to. Well, um, isn't Department of Corrections officers? So wouldn't that. But they're not to... first responders. This is really uh, geared towards first responders. Okay. So. They work, they work I, in the prisons. Yeah. Yeah, or in the field, but there, there's, so I, I hope that it will it, it could expand. Mm -hmm. I've had some requests from some other states about how to model the the training in their states. Um, so we'll see. Hopefully mm -hmm. it'll keep going. Well, um, anything else you want to like to add? I think something important to understand about Team Two is it's not a stagnant training, meaning um, not just one day and it's finished. Well, that and uh, you know I think that we've seen people that don't just take it once; they come back and take it multiple times after that because the training material um, adapts, I think, um, with the current environment that we work in and with the updates from law enforcement, mental health, state's attorney, and, and all the other stakeholders that, that, that go to the training. So it's not uh, something that you go to twice and it's the exact same material every single time. It keeps growing, it keeps building, and that's 
very yeah. important for, for training purposes. Okay. Any, any questions you would like to add? Uh, um, how, how long have you been, been a police officer? And, and involved with Team 2? Like, yeah. So I, I started uh, in, at the Berlin Police Department in March of 2019. And then I just recently switched over to the Montpelier Police Department at the beginning of September. And I started, I forget when I did my first Team 2 training. I want to say it was like April of, we were, we were on Zoom, right? We, we, yeah, during the it pandemic. had to have been 2020, so yeah. beginning of 2020. Yeah, how, before we end, how, how is Team, I know we should have done this question at the beginning, but during the pandemic, Team 2 must have been a little... We had to pivot. We had to pivot a little bit, Lawrence. Uh, so we, we did the trainings uh, virtually on using Zoom mm -hmm. um, with everybody safe in their own environments. Um, that was all of last year. And this year, we are, we've had, uh, we're having two in-person trainings of the four that were scheduled for this fall. Mm -hmm. Two have been, uh, will be in-person, in and two are on Zoom. Is it and they're harder partly, to do a training, a police training on Zoom? Oh yeah, it's a lot harder. But it's also has provided, I mean, during the pandemic, there were more participants than I've ever had because they could do it by Zoom. They didn't have to travel, they didn't have to find parking, they didn't have to worry about being away from, you know, picking up their kids or whatever. So we had way more uh, people sign up and register when they could do it virtually. So that's why we left it with a couple of trainings still by Zoom, also because of the, there's a couple of regions that are really big. The Southwest region is Bennington, Rutland, and Addison County, and so there's a lot more travel for people. Here in Montpelier, we did the training in person at the end of September. Uh, we were able to use a really big space over at the Pavilion Building so people could spread out. But also the Central region is, um, you know, people aren't coming from very far away. It's just uh, Washington and Orange counties. So it was relatively easy for people to get here. Okay. Um, well, we would like to thank you for joining us. On thank you for having us. On air. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, for more information on Washington County and its programs, you can go to www. Um, WCMHS.org. That's www.WCMHS.org. Uh, and for more information on, um, uh, is there a number for people who are in crisis that would like to? Um, the crisis oh, number? I don't, I actually, I don't know the crisis number. Uh, it, so if you're in crisis and need assistance with Washington County mental health, you can go. Uh, to 1-802-229-0591. That number is 802-229-0591. Well, uh, uh, we would like to thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many others, including the, um, the partnership with the Association for the Blind of, of, of um, Vermont, the Division for the Blind in Vermont, Central Vermont um, Habitat for Humanity, and we would like to especially thank today the Montpelier Police Department and Officer. How do you pronounce? How do you pronounce your name? Everyone calls me Officer Victor, but my last name's Hanahosa. Okay, oh, um, Officer Victor Hanahosa of the uh, Montpelier um, Police Department, and thank you to uh, Kristen Chandler of Team Two. Um, this puts an end to um, A Boulder on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. A Boulder on Air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services. Empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, 
New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yachad New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity. Able Dinner on Air has been seen in the following publications. Parkchester Times, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, and www.h. Ableton On Air is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England, Chapter.